Hi, good evening, everybody. Today is Tuesday. Help me out here, Jason, but I think May it's the 19th. May 19th. Yes. <laughs> Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. You are watching yet another edition of Forward Maryland. My name is Bill Woodcock. And I'm Jason Booms. Jason, Hi. how are you settling in on day 206 of our quarantine? <laughs> We're that far in the countdown, are we? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that Venusian days. <laughs> uh, doing well, actually. Uh, actually thinking a lot about the future, looking at the primary, looking past the primary, looking at 2022. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so life is good. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned 2022 because that's a perfect segue into our special guest for today. Uh, Longtime uh, uh, fans of this show will remember that we are Howard County based, but we also are Forward Maryland, uh, not just Forward Howard County. And uh, there are many uh, wonderful folks who we have been bringing you from time to time from other corners of the state who are interesting, pretty cool, and are doing some things that, uh, you know, we think you ought to know about and we think serve as a model. Uh, so uh, this evening, we're proud to have on our show a freshman delegate from District 33 in Anne Arundel County uh, and uh, everywhere from, I believe, Cape Sinclair to Crofton, if I'm remembering the map correctly, with, with Crownsville in between, lots of seeds. Uh, her name is Delegate Heather Bagnell. So, Delegate, welcome. Thank you. We're, we are very glad to have you here, and because uh, we do get what, well, listeners and watchers from uh, Anne Arundel County, but most of our folks are Howard, Baltimore, Baltimore City, um, Prince George's, and Montgomery based. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in public service and how you came to represent District 33 in the House of Delegates? Um, thank you very much, first of all, for that intro. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite honored to be a person of, of, uh, of, of interest in, in a good way. Um, I, my, my background is, is in theater. I spent um, years and years working, working in theater and in arts administration and arts education. Um, and uh, and I, I, I definitely did not have the traditional path to politics. Um, but I did grow up in this area. I actually, um, I represent District 33, which runs basically from the Bay Bridge out, um, out west and south. So it encompasses Cape St. Clair, St. Margaret's, uh, Arnold, Severna Park, a little bit of Severn, a little bit of Riva, Crofton, Crownsville, uh, and a little bit of Davidsonville. Uh, we describe it as is the heart of Anne Arundel County, but on a map, it looks like a wing and a thigh. So. Um, Although when I say that, sometimes people sort of look askance at me. But, um, but I would I would be I would be remiss if I didn't say that 2016 had a huge influence on me and on on, on my decision to run. Um, uh, I have I started out as an actor and eventually evolved into a playwright, which means that human stories are always of interest to, to me. And um, over the last few years, I have been writing a lot about sort of social commentary, but putting it in, in a framework that starts out as a very personal story and sort of expands to, to the universal. And um, a few years ago, I took a job with, um, with Disney, and enough time has passed, I don't think I'll get them in trouble, but um, while I was working for them, I ended up on all the committees. You know, I ended up as the entertainment representative for, you know, for Feast and Mast and all of, all of these various committees. And, um, and one of the committees that I was on, the hospitality staff didn't have a representative. So the restaurant staff, they came to me and they said they had this concern because uh, their restrooms weren't working. And when you are a server, um, you get a, essentially a 10 minute break every four hours. And so you go to one restroom, it's not working, you go to a second one and by then your break is over. And, um, and I had spent many years as, you know, in dinner theater. So I, so I, so I knew that struggle well. Um, so I said, that's fine, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take your concern. And, uh, and I went to a meeting and I brought this up and 
it was it was one of those moments where you realize people are well intentioned but they don't understand the experience because the response was well it's probably safer if they go and use their their cabins anyway and i sort of took a moment and um and i said so so what you're telling me is that we a multi-million dollar industry the largest entertainment venue in the world can't meet the same minimum standards as an incarcerated community um and in the room kind of got quiet and they said we're gonna we're gonna come back next week and we're gonna have a response and, and they and and they they immediately not only did they repair everything they actually completely renovated um but that that moment where where i was advocating for people who did not have a voice it it, it really stuck with me and then um sort of fast forward a little bit and for two years prior to uh the the 2016 election i actually was in a play playing emma goldman now emma goldman has not been remembered well by history unfortunately named <laughs> But she was, uh, you know, she was an early advocate for, um, for, for the working poor. And I spent two years um, reciting these fiery speeches that, that they were historic speeches. Uh, and then after the 2016 election, I was, I was actually working in New York at the time and I drove back down to Maryland just to make sure that my vote would count because I didn't trust, um, I didn't trust mail-in ballots at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tell one but um <laughs> but but I drove by the time I got back to New York because I was still under contract so I had to drive back to New York and by the time I got to New York um the uh the results were coming in and I had an apartment that in in New York that uh, I had a number of, of roommates that that maintained it when I wasn't there and um and they were all coming in and they were crying and uh and I said we're gonna figure this out I I don't I don't know what we're gonna do but we're gonna figure this out and you know, over the next few months, we really saw the the, the impact of um, of the election. And 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 working in New York, you saw it fairly immediately. Mm -hmm. There's an urgency in New York that we don't have in Maryland as much. Maryland feels a little safer. It's a more sort of um, dispersed community, so you don't see the impacts quite so immediately. But I took the next year uh, and tried to decide what I could do. You know, I was, I was writing to sort of keep people going. And, um, and what I was saying seemed to resonate with people. And, and a few of my friends started asking me if I would run for office. And I said, well, I can't do anything at the federal level. I can't, I've, I've, at that point that, you know, Congress was, was at a stalemate. And I said, I can't affect any sort of change, but maybe I can run at the state level and at least make sure the people around me are safe and secure and until we you know figure out the bigger picture so um you know in a, in a huge twist of irony i ran worried that there might one day be a national crisis and it would fall to the states to act and that is actually where we find ourselves um so i oddly ran in preparation for this very moment which is pretty amazing. And, and it's, you know, and um, I, I love the story. I love this story of how you came, of how you came to run. And I mean, I know of several folks from visual arts backgrounds who have run and have served in office. You're the first person who has a background in the performing arts who I, who I know who's run and served in office. And I guess any, if there's any uh, political person out there in listener land who might be thinking, oh, well, she just picked her shot. Um, I'm just going to say you ran in not an impossible district, but a very, very difficult district uh, for a Democrat to run in. I mean, not I mean, I'm just going to say what we said during the pre-show, <laughs> not purple. That bad boy's red. Uh, and it had been read for what 20 years before. So how did you do that? Well, I mean, I didn't do it on my own for sure. Part of part of what put me in office was 
the number of people that were running up and down that ballot. I mean, we were, we were you know, beating the bushes for, for, for voters. Um, and also, you know, I was, I was speaking to a lot of the independent voters who previously had skewed more conservative, but really didn't like what was happening at the federal level. And despite sort of my big picture, um, my big picture uh, sort of impetus for running, I ran on very local concerns, very local concerns. In fact, um, there, were, there were three pieces of advice I was given right out of the get-go. They said, whatever you do, don't tell anyone, anyone you're an artist. Uh, don't talk about uh, public transportation and don't talk about affordable housing. So the first thing I did is I told everyone I was an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ran on, on public transportation and affordable housing because I grew up here. And when I was in middle school, I did an experiment to see how long it would take me to get from my house to what is now Westfield Shopping Center. It was the Annapolis Mall. And, um, and I walked down College Parkway, which if you're not familiar with this area, is a, a major, it's a major, major highway that has no sidewalks and very little shoulder. Mm -hmm walked um, about a mile and a half to the, uh, the community college where there is a bus stop. And two of the buses didn't show up. The third one finally did. And then I, I got to, to the mall two and a half hours later and it's eight miles from my home to the Annapolis Mall. Now that was about 30 years ago, which tells you how old I am. But, um, but nothing has changed or very little has changed. We still don't have sidewalks. We still don't have reliable um, bus services. Um, and, and you still have to have transportation to get around this area. And, and, it's, and it's built up significantly. So the lack of those public services is even more profound now than it was even 30 years ago. Um, but, but, you know, really so much of, so much of, of my flipping this seat was 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 a collective effort on 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 so many of us that that just partnered together and were trying to amplify each other as much as possible. Um, and I did have one advantage in that I was an artist, and, and the reason that I wanted to make sure that that I was running on that is because I have been an artist. I've been a performing artist for 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 you know thirty plus years, and I said, well, if the one time I'm running for office, I shy away from that. What does that tell everyone else? that I have worked with and taught and I've spent all of, you know, all of these years advocating for the legitimacy of the arts. And then when I have, I have an opportunity to really, you know, legitimize them, I have a platform for it, I don't do it. Um, and, and that actually meant a lot to the arts community. And artists, we may, we may not have a lot of money, but we are networked. So, so, um, so I had a lot of support, not just across Maryland, but I had people in New York and people in Florida and people in Missouri, all of these people that I have, I have worked with over the years. I had people in, in, in England that were following this, this like little state race in the middle of, you know, this, this, this that is absolutely terrific. Jason, this is, Normally, I get two questions in, and then this is normally the time you break in. Yeah, then I'll start asking quirky questions, um, and I'll start now. Um, so, again, a bit about your, your background that just absolutely fascinates me. And, and, and frankly, I'm surprised. Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, but uh, when it comes to people saying, oh, you shouldn't talk about being an artist, uh, I can think of uh, one particular performing artist who did quite well for himself. He was somewhere between Carter and Bush, I believe. <laughs> uh, but... Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my, I had a chance to read through your biography and I, and I saw that you uh, uh, studied at uh, Second City in Chicago. Is, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah, I, I won't ask for your Fred, favorite Fred Willard story unless you happen to have one. But uh, so how did, um, I mean, let's go into the idea of communications and, and, and public service and public policy. Um, have you found it to be a, a benefit having that kind of background, being a you know, playwright, an actor, and having you know, some improv chops? Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, that that's, that's what I studied while I was in, in Second City is I studied improvisation mm -hmm. and, and that's been incredibly useful um, because, you know, just being an artist in general, 
is really useful because you sometimes sometimes I think being an expert can be actually a, a detriment when you're trying to create really good, strong, comprehensive policy. You need policy experts. You need the experts there, but you need um, you need other voices. You need other perspectives because if you are seeing, if you are looking at something through one filter, you you can miss you can miss things, and um, and you know the improv has given me the ability to to to, to look at policy and and ask ask the you know the yes and questions. There's <laughs> there's an expression in okay. improv <laughs> is yes and, which is um, for anyone who who doesn't know what that is, it's when you take an idea, you take what is given to you, usually from a scene partner, and you add on to it. And I actually taught this. I, I you know I, I um. I have a, a program I used to teach an after school program called cultivating kindness through theater arts and it was using theater games to teach communication team building empathy and compassion. Um, but but yes and is is it's foundational for improv and it's where you take what you're given and you add on to it, but you never reject it You never say, um, you know, no, because that stops the scene. Well, when you're trying to create policy for a, a a broad range of interests, a broad range of economies, a broad range of, of demographics. And, and you can, yes, and you can take what you have and you can keep building on it. And you build on it from, from as many voices as you can get. And then you take what's best from that and you leave the rest. And that's, that's honestly how we operated in, in arts nonprofits for years and years and years, because mm -hmm. generally you've got a skeleton crew anyway. So getting eight or 10 people around a table isn't a problem more of a challenge in government when you're talking about a thousand people, but you want to at least get, you know, representatives from all of these different communities. Um, and, and yes, and your way to some really good comprehensive policy. Awesome. Well, it's always glad to hear that uh, you, you can take that skill set and uh, help foster collaboration within a very <laughs> different context. So that's fantastic. And, and, and so what have been the things for your first two years in the legislature? Of course, this this year, this last session was cut short due to uh, COVID-19. But what have been your your priorities for, you know, that you've been working on in, in 33? Well, my, my first year was really my first my first session, I should say. Um, it was really about learning those hallways. I said, because if I if I'm going to be an effective advocate, for my constituents, I need to to really know how the system works. I, I'm a, I'm very much a process person, which um, surprises people because they 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 would think that I'd be I would be much more sort of um, think chaotic, and and I'm not. I really love process, um, but I wanted to understand those halls, and I also wanted to understand sort of where where my allies were, and what the power structure was. Because if you want to, you know, if you want to change the system, you have to work within the system to change it. So I really needed a clear understanding of what the system was, what the lay of the land was. And um, in that first, that first year was, was just really, really helpful for understanding how the committees worked, you know, what, what my role in that committee was. And, and I have found that my role is to ask the questions, you know, to, to keep saying, well, you know, why do we do it this way? And, um, and if the answer is because we've always done it that way, then to say, well, what if we tried something else? Mm -hmm. um, but this last year, I really focused in on, um, on behavioral health. And, uh, you know, I, I have family members that, that suffer with, with, um, with behavioral health issues. And also working in the arts, you have a lot of people that, you know, food insecurity, they have home insecurity, they have been ostracized or victimized just for being who they are. So um, you have a lot of people that come from trauma. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one of the schools in my community has the unfortunate uh, nickname of Suicide High. And after a, a, a suicide last year, a group of students organized and they actually came to me and said, you know, can you, can you help us? So, um, 
so I, I, I sat down with them and I sat, I actually had parents that were coming and talking to me and asking, asking for help. And, um, and I, you know, reached out to the behavioral health community. I reached out to mental health, uh, association cause I had met, um, I had met one of the, the members at, at, at Mako. Uh, mm-hmm. he talk about, um, the resources that were in, in, uh, the prison population and in, in pre-release. I thought, no, well, why can't we mirror that before you go to, because so many people that are, you know, in prison really have an underlying mental health concern and, 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 uh, and we just don't have the adequate resources. So, so again, I, I, I went through the process. I talked to my chair and my vice chair, because I'm on health and government operations. And, uh, and I said, this is what I want to do. I said, I, I really want adolescent access to behavioral health services to be you know, my, my, my primary focus. Mm -hmm. Um, I said, it came right from my constituency. It came right from my district. And I said, and, and I have had a front row seat, uh, to mental health issues for, you know, 20 plus years. And they said, you know, run with it. And I said, who do I talk to? Cause I want to make sure I'm not like stepping on toes or reinventing Mm -hmm. or, or doing work that's already being done. So they told me who to talk to, and I talked to to a couple of my colleagues, and 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 everybody said the same thing: nobody's taking this approach. Nobody's taking this approach. Just run with it. Um, and I had a, a meeting with one of the chairs of the subcommittees that, and she said, you know, you've got about six years of work here ahead of you. And I said, well, then I better stay for at least another term. So, <laughs> but um, but but that's that's become a. a not a singular focus, but a but a, a, a primary focus. And that's such a, a critical it's a thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. I just want to make it real quick there. Um, well, no, you go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I I frequently do work in the in in the public health space, and um, such as you know dealing with uh, developing uh, you know patient safety toolkits. And mm-hmm. one of the recurring themes we we hear this is of course pre COVID, is people saying, well, we need to spend more time helping uh, physicians and other clinicians find a way to talk with people about the behavioral health uh, element to it as well. And I would imagine, particularly at this point in time, uh, with the schools out uh, and a a lot of folks Mm -hmm. at home, and you see that dynamic, which isn't always the best for a lot of kids, and and they have to face very challenging situations without the the sometimes release of going to schools and being able to spend time with their friends and and teachers. Mm Um, sort of moving ahead, do you have any particular thoughts on things you'd like to see enacted over the next uh, couple of years that can really do a good job of promoting uh, adolescent behavioral health? Well, I think one of the biggest, the biggest challenges is that we have expectations for the schools Mm -hmm. that are not, they're not supported by the resources we actually have. Mm -hmm. Now you, Mm -hmm. even during, even during, um, during this last session when we were having discussions about the blueprint and everybody kept saying, put more money into resources, put more money into resources. And they would say, we need to hire more counselors. Well, the definition of a counselor in an educational environment is different than the definition of a counselor in a healthcare environment. And legislators don't always make the distinction because because they don't know, because we're not experts in everything. And and, and there's, there's no way we could be. Um, but so there's, there's a whole educational component that comes with doing this work. Um, and that a lot of, a lot of that was actually what we were doing this year is just trying to educate legislators on what it was we were actually talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's labor intensive. And I had, I had a, I had a bill that, that would have broadened, um, adolescent access, uh, and actually would have, it would have aligned some of our statutes because even the way that we treat uh, adolescent care for substance use is different than mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, the you know the statutes aren't aligned, and 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 it's it, and it gets very in the weeds <laughs> in trying to 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 educate people on why this isn't the big scary that they think it is. Um, but I think the biggest, the, the biggest impact that we could have is if we just recognized behavioral health as health. 
as health preventative care. If we could get a, a behavioral health screening as part of a standard yearly physical. But there are so many components to doing that. It's not just saying this is a good idea. It's getting the insurers to reimburse for it. Mm -hmm. The physician trained for it. It's getting the word out that this is how we have changed policy. Um, and, and, and we're working with, with advocates and stakeholders uh, to do just that. And in fact, I'm on, a, um, I'm on a crisis bed work group, which it's about 25 experts in their fields from all different, you know, uh, from ER docs and nurses to, um, to the mental health association, the hospital association, the, you know, the health department. Um, and it was really exciting and grueling work. Um, and we had a piece of legislation, piece of legislation that would have created um, a bed registry, just a pilot. Um, and it was nine months of work from 25 experts. And then with the stroke of a pen, it was, that work was wiped away. And it left us all really confused as to why, <laughs> when you had so many experts saying, this is a good idea, this is something we need. When you had the hospital saying, basically begging for it because they don't have the resources to even do the referrals um, and the placements. And so much of that comes down to the fact that we, even though we have parity in the law with the Affordable Care Act, we have parity between um, somatic care and behavioral health care, we don't have parity. We don't have parity in terms of resources and we don't have parity in terms of, of compassion. You know, there's still this stigma behind it where people view it as, as, as some sort of personal failing. Right. And to get it to the point where it's, where it's preventative care, then it's no longer a personal failing. And you see that at the schools all the time. My wife is an educator and, and she often uh, speaks about, you know, having conversations with uh, I would say always, but sometimes has conversations where parents are, are reluctant to say that there is an issue there. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had there been an opportunity for an evaluation or a conversation with, with a clinician, uh, perhaps some, some greater aid uh, could have taken place to, to, to help out that child. Yeah. And, and I'll thank you for pulling the lid off of this issue, Delegate, because I, I, I had one or the other child in high school for almost the entire 2010s and you brought up a really amazing point i mean kids my kids age and their peers are extraordinarily open to the need for mental health behavioral health treating the mind and and frankly the spirit uh just as equally as the body but it's people and i think we're of their same relative age bracket here um, who aren't as willing and maybe, maybe accidentally, maybe not so accidentally, not putting the resources in place or not providing the access to the resources. So, or not destigmatizing, to use a word that was used a little bit ago, the whole mental health, behavioral health system as being just as important. And I think that creates that. I know I've seen it create a lot of disconnects in Howard County in terms mm -hmm. of what the school system provides to kids because that disconnect of what a counselor is is very much there. An academic counselor is not there to talk about, you know, your a, a child's issues and really shouldn't be talking about that. So thank right. you very much for bringing this sort of a distinction to. To the forefront it's so important when it, 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 it it's, it's interesting because it was so much on the radar of so many of the freshmen in both the, the house and the senate um that, that we all started just talking to each other because we said you know there it feels like it feels like there's a groundswell right now where there's actual support and we have the ability to have a cultural shift 
and it is it's it's, it's generational but it's also it's also um there's there's a lot of distrust in a lot of the minority communities because um mental health behavioral health has has been weaponized in the past i mean healthcare in general you know healthcare disparities have been weaponized against against certain communities and you have to be cognizant of that so which makes this work all the more challenging because it's it's basically re-educating and instilling trust in the older communities that we are working for you know the benefit and safety of their children mm -hmm. and and you know and it, it, I, i'm sure that's really challenging <laughs> It's hard to trust anyone with, with your child's care. <laughs> so. Right, right. So we are on a very health-focused program this evening, which is wonderful, uh, because, so switching topics, um, COVID-19. Um, Jason and I have talked a few times on our podcast about, about uh, state leadership on COVID-19. We hear from the governor. We hear from our county executive, as I know Anne Arundel County does too. In between, not so much, but we, we have a state senator here, Katie Hester, who, is, who has been informing her uh, constituents, and, and you have been doing a wonderful job, too. Maybe if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing there. Well, I've, you know, again, my background is in education, so I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, an educated constituency is an engaged constituency. Um, I'm, I, do, I don't want to fool people. I want them to be able to make informed decisions. Um, even if, if in, and if I'm, if I'm working on their behalf, even if they don't like what I'm doing, I always want to, you know, explain it. I always, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to do something that, that I can't, you know, that I can't stand behind. Um, and when, when, uh, when COVID-19, you know, first, when, when the alarm bells were first going off and we were still in session and we were getting briefings from the health department, um, I started asking a lot of questions. In fact, um, I reached out to the health department at one point and said, you know, what are our protocols for grocery stores? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, well you've got two, two communities that work in grocery stores. You've got uh, high school and college students, you've got senior citizens, you've got a carrier population, you've got a vulnerable population. That was before we even knew that it had much broader uh, impact on, on a, a larger spectrum of ages. Um, and, and at first, the, you know, the, there wasn't much of a response. And the next day, they, they, they had MEMA, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, all on the call to say, yeah, you're, you know what, we need some protocols, and not just for consumers, but for the employees. Um, and, and the more I asked those questions, the more challenging it was to find the answers. You know, it was, it was, well, you need to talk to the Department of Labor at that. You need to talk to the Department of Health about that. You need to talk the, to the county about that. And I said, I said, where's the repository of information? And they said, there isn't one. So I made one. And then I sent it out to my colleagues and said, you know, use this if it's useful. Do it yourself if it's not. But I said, I think we have to be the repository because there isn't one. In fact, some of, you know, as I was, as I was pulling resources and, and vetting them myself, um, I would sometimes find that, that even the resources that were coming out of, of, of the, the, the administration from, from the governor were conflicting each other. And I think, you know, again, that's the nature of, of these agencies being very siloed. I think we talked about that offline. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and having to, to, to react very quickly. So I don't, I don't fault the administration for that, but I said, if I'm providing resources to my constituency, um, I want to make sure that they're accurate and they're the most up to date, and that if nothing else, I'm at least streamlining the process of them looking for that information, because we had, I mean, we had things that were coming from the feds, we had things that were coming from small business, we had things that were coming from independent business, we had information coming from the health department, and 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 I I feel like. For you know, for for the average voter, that's that's a lot of information to try and process. And then when you're hearing, you know, from you're already being inundated and saturated from the national landscape. Mm -hmm. I just I just need to make this easier for people. 
and 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 you have and and i believe tomorrow is i think the third of your three town halls uh, yep our three town halls so so we did the first one we did was on health um and 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 again we went we went nice and local because the governors um and and the health department had uh, been coordinating with all of the local health departments. So I said, well, then it makes sense to get our information from our local health officer, because that's going to be the most current information. That's going to be the most accurate. Uh, and then last week we had our, um, we had our uh, economic impact town hall and, and we had the Department of Commerce, Secretary of Department of Commerce, uh, Secretary Schultz, but we had two of our chambers of commerce, because then we were hearing from the members, you know, from, from, from our local folks, you know, what it was. Um, but we also had on that call, we had um, uh, Adam Spangler from, Con from Congressman Brown's office, who was, you know, taking that information and parsing it out um, so, that, so that we could look at the federal level at what our local guys were saying they needed. To, in order to, to open safely and, and sustain businesses. Because um, you know, my, my worry from, from the get-go has been if we don't do this right and we do it piecemeal, we actually endanger more businesses than we preserve. Uh, and then tomorrow is our third town hall, which is on education, because we have not had a broad scale uh, sort of statewide coordinated response in terms of education, um, which has been a, a source of frustration for a lot of people. And there's still a lot of a lot of uh, question marks. Now, I am curious because I uh, because the last two times I've done a town hall, the day I did the he the health town hall, um, the administration that day announced new protocols. And last week when I did the economic town hall um, at five o'clock, Hogan announced the, uh, phase one of the reopen. So sure. I'm feeling <laughs> <laughs> breaking news <laughs> that we'll we'll have some some education information this week. Not that, not that I think uh, you know I think the the governor is actually following along, but it just it it just seems that, that the timing is uh is quite coincidental. <laughs> it, it, it that is it that it that it is that it is. I like and, to think I'm just, I'm just I'm just I'm just on the cutting edge. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would urge whoever, wherever anybody is watching or listening this, uh, to this from, to go on Delegate Bagnall's Facebook page, and, or I think it's on your website too, and, mm -hmm. or, or, and check out any of the town halls. Uh, because, I mean, Anne Arundel County is another county like Howard and Baltimore and many others, very diverse in every possible way. And some of the mm -hmm. answers, some of the questions are transferable and you can find out who your own people are, where you are and figure out some of those things. But there were, because there were a few things there and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, what are we doing about that? And most of those answers I could find, a couple of them I needed to follow up on. So it's very useful resource. So kind of wrapping up, you know, I know that you know, I, I, I think we're maybe, we're maybe not in the second inning, but maybe in the third inning of this nine inning game called uh, uh, COVID-19. Hopefully we won't go into extras in, uh, in November, December. Um, but what do you, I mean, what do you think? I mean, you know, I don't know if you, I don't know if you have your crystal ball with you, um, but you know, recovering from this uh, on the state government level next year, what what do you think that's going to look like, and and what sort of you know what sort of things are you are you already seeing down the road? You're going to have to wrangle with next January when the legislature comes back. Well, I, I can tell you what I hope, um, and then sort of if I had to read the tea leaves, where where I think we're going. Um, unfortunately, one of one of the challenges is that I think we are we are starting to see the impact of the f the federal um, division mm -hmm. starting to to bleed over into the state where where we have we've had we've had some distance from it. You know, we've been able to to work cooperatively, but um, but I'm seeing that less and less, and um, and there, there seems to be a lot of pressure to, to, 
to, to reopen, which is, which is alarming because we haven't asked all the questions we need to answer yet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that came up in that town hall, um, you know, three hours before, before uh, the announcement of, of phase one was that we don't have childcare. And we are likely not even going to discuss childcare until s some point this week, um, which, you know, women are traditionally caregivers, and that is is a it's a concerning um, it's a concerning dynamic because uh, it's an effective way of getting women out of the workforce. And mm -hmm. I want to believe that that's the intention, but that could very easily be the unintended consequence of, of doing this too quickly and not strategically. And uh, that's something that I'm always looking for in, in every bill that we write is the unintended consequences. And um, even from this opening, we saw unintended consequences over the weekend that, you know, the Department of, of, of Commerce hasn't hasn't responded yet. And it's, it's Tuesday, we opened on Friday. Um, so in terms of what the, the General Assembly is going to look like, I mean, it's tough to know because so much of it is dependent on um, what happens at the federal level, how much we are reimbursed. But the longer that we don't address things like the unemployment crisis, which, you know, people are now in their 11th week of right. no pay. Um, and our federal delegation passed relief legislation two months ago that still has not made it into the hands of, of, of many, many of our, our Marylanders, um, whether it's, it's unemployment, whether it was the payroll protection program, whether it was the small business disaster loans, they, it, it didn't make it into their hands. It didn't trickle down. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of questions that we have not answered. And my biggest concern is that um, historically, our governor has, has been a no taxes, no taxes, um, and, um, and a, a small government guy. And right now, you see why that becomes a problem in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We don't have the resources. And if it just turns into a, you know, a, a gutting of the entire system, that does not actually create a very good path forward for Marylanders. It's not an effective use of our resources to just, you know, to, to just sort of, um, you know, slash and burn. Um, all of our, all of our programs and 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 I think we got um, we got a preview of that with the thirty two vetoes, which was i I believe that was a record um, right. and and it and it it wasn't consistent so i'm I'm cautiously optimistic because Marylanders are extremely resilient. And, and, and in, um, ingenuitive and compassionate. Um, and you're seeing people figuring out how to pivot, how to open their businesses in a new way, how to do business in a new way. But we, as, as elected representatives, have to figure out the best path to, to support that effort rather than just sort of pulling out, um, you know, pulling out all of the, the, the safety nets while yeah, they're there, trying to recover. Yeah, there, therein lies a grand concern of mine as well that, that I, I started thinking about last week is that it would, and, and I agree with you, it would be wonderful that the gap be closed in state revenue with some phase four or whatever other funding may come down the pike. Uh, I'm not sure any of the three of us are, would expect anything like that. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a gap and it could very well be a big one. And, um, you know, I can remember when Republicans in Annapolis 
made light of several decisions that a Democratic governor made as being a platform to run for president. And uh, certainly our governor has been on TV a lot uh, and has gotten a lot of notoriety for what he's done for the response. And, you know, I, I'm concerned about how big of a club that that gives him is to say, well, you know, we had to fight the coronavirus and so now we're all going to have to pull our, pull our belts a little tighter and give up some things. And uh, that certainly helps him politically in terms of future ambitions. What it doesn't do is help a lot of Marylanders who are, as you said, still looking for support three months later and are still going to need support seven or eight months from now. They are, and, and, and their businesses need support because just, just reopening when you don't have consumer confidence, when you don't have protocols in place, when you don't know what liability is, right. it, it jeopardizes more businesses than it saves. You know, I, I, one of, one of, I had two slogans when, when I ran. I had get in the room because I said all of the answers are in the room somewhere. I just have to get in there and talk to the right people but also change the narrative. And something that has alarmed me at the national level and now at the state level is the fact that we've changed the narrative from helping people to how many people are dispensable. And people have gone from, you know, names and photo albums and, and, and you know, Christmases and birthdays to numbers. Mm -hmm. Anytime you see that trend, it's alarming. And I've, you know, we've seen it, we've seen, we've seen it from the president who, who touts this only 80,000 people have died, only 80,000, um, which is, which is an, an astronomical number. But we also have seen it sort of a, a little more subtly at the state level. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually something that I reached out to the Department of Labor about because they, they, they've been touting this, you know, 300,000 people that have filed successfully, 300,000 people that have been served mm -hmm. out of 435,000, 135,000 people. And we're, we're, and we're, and we're taking a victory lap. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that 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 we're keeping we're keeping a face on those 135,000 people, because uh, you know I, I'm not willing to allow 135,000 Marylanders to become expendable. No, two two M and T Bank stadiums full of people. Not a good luck. No, it's it and it's, it and again I don't know how much we can do. I know the Department of Labor is working you know, like gangbusters. I don't question the staff. I, I can't even imagine being on the receiving end of, of, of the phone calls that I receive, receiving them eight hours a day, you know, six days a week. Um, but that being said, we can't then say, you know, everything's rosy and the glass is half full. Jason, do you have any other questions? Uh, I do. Well, actually, I, I, I have several arcane process questions for a process <laughs> person, but I, I think those can wait till the next time uh, you come on the, the program. Oh, uh, right. I do have one very quick question, and you, you came very close to this with the get in the room and changing the narrative, and this is a question I've asked a few times, uh, and it, uh, it really comes down to sort of distilling what your key animating principles are. People wanted to hear what you were all about in sort of an elevator pitch form. How would you answer the question, what's your deal? <laughs> you know, my deal, um, when, I, when I was running for office, the thing that I discovered is that a lot of people just don't understand local. They don't understand local government. They don't know what we do. We sort of truck along. They show up, you know, every couple of years and, and vote for us. But, they, but, but until there's a crisis, they don't really know what's going on. And they're kind of embarrassed to ask because they think they're the only ones who don't know. Nobody knows. You know, that's the big, that's the big secret that, that, I, that I told everybody. I said, you know, I didn't know any more than you did until six months before you did. 
and now I'm standing on your doorstep. And you know, if you want me to run you through a the, through a civics lesson right here, I'll do it because I don't want anyone to ever be embarrassed to ask. You know, by the time people by the time people are even calling my office, they've already tried to figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. are in, inherently hardworking. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're just. They're just busy, and they're not experts at everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my deal is that I'm here to to figure out where we need to get to, and how to get us there. Who can and who who we who we need to talk to to get us there? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's as as a playwright, I actually start from the end of the story and work backwards. And that's kind of what I'm doing in office now too. It's like, okay, well, we need to get there. We're here. Um, who's got a good idea? Mm -hmm. And and people have really good ideas, and they are just they don't they don't realize that you know that their their voice is welcome. I mean, I I kind of want to make local government sexy, you know, <laughs> like, like civic engagement. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. So awesome. Delegate Bagnall, thank you so much for being on the show, and and so certainly we hope you will come on again at some point in the future, and keep fighting for your uh, constituents in District Thirty Three and for and for all of us uh, in the state of Maryland. This has really been a pleasure, and uh, to to dovetail onto something Jason mentioned earlier, I I don't I didn't know anybody other than yourself delegate who's been in the performing arts and run for office. I did, of course, know of Ronald Reagan, as well as former congressman, late congressman, Fred Grandy and Sonny Bono, and perhaps the person I will put out there as the most uh, maybe significant performing artist ever to hold high elected office, Jesse the Body Ventura. So <laughs> just saying. I could there do is that. the governor too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, where do we go without Arnold? Uh, you know, I remember signing a, a petition back in the 90s to amend the Constitution to allow Arnold to be eligible to run for president <laughs> just because that seemed so much fun. Why not? So, um, Jason, anything else on your end? Oh, and uh, Ben Jones uh, from uh, Dukes of Hazard, right? He was, or is that? Oh goodness, there were many. Yes. But I think I think I'm the first playwright. At least in the state of Maryland, I'm the first. <laughs> the the thoughts spin the mind of like <laughs> candidacy for governor of New York, <laughs> for Sydney Lumet for governor That's of Rhode right. Island. It would have been beautiful. So thank you again, delegate, and do come on again. Uh, Jason, anything else? That's it for me. All right. And well, thank that's you very it. much. Oh, it's our pleasure. And uh, join me on Friday. I'll be interviewing uh, Howard County Board of Education candidate James Diesel. Uh, and thank you again for watching or listening to another edition of Forward Maryland. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.